hopefully sometimes doesn't always uh, what i'll do is i'll get it up on my um phone as well just because just so i can see if it is live because yeah. otherwise it says it's live but it's not so let me just check should be live now yeah i think it's come up live now perfect brilliant so yeah yeah that's all on perfect so i'm here with tom holmes and we're going to be talking about um exercise considerations for older populations so um tom's a physio but i'll let tom introduce himself so over to you tom yeah thanks for having me matt um as, as you say i'm a physio i work um predominantly in, in professional sport and i have of course a, a wide range of settings but i also do some private practice as well yeah so what we um kind of want to go through is obviously i work with a, a range of um clients but maybe mainly ladies over 40 who have either one or two maybe exercised before um a lot and then got an injury like a lot of the ladies have mentioned before they've worked with horses it's completely put me off ever working with horses because everyone's like i think i heard something yesterday from one lady she said it takes seven fools to make a good rider or something um yeah or um maybe someone's not exercised for a long long time and they've got back into it so i wanted to touch on a few questions and i've got facebook open as well so if anyone does have any questions they can kind of comment below but first question would be is there any considerations that someone needs to just kind of look at before going into it just from any point of view let's say someone hasn't exercised for a while would there any be would there be like some go-to thing that someone should do should someone be cautious or should you go straight in like what would you kind of recommend with that? i mean you'd probably take each case on its own merit um the, the current guidelines for exercise and in, in people that are well 60 and, and above is about 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week but obviously the, in above yeah okay but you know you're probably not looking at too far off that guideline is 150 minutes a week for, for people who are say in their 50s 40s i mean it depends really to go straight into that from someone who's not done it before is it's going to be a bit of a shock to their system so it's going to take a while for them to probably customize to that but when you really think about it, it's not actually that much, 150 minutes a week. Yeah, so if you break it down, it's a moderate, uh, sorry, intense exercise. It's not actually that much. So, I mean, to take, take each person as their own sort of case. And then it's always a good idea for those sort of populations to surround themselves with, with their peers because it can be quite intimidating, I guess, for someone who's not been to, to a gym or to a, a class for a while to, to enter that environment yeah. so to have people that are in a similar scenario is always very helpful and then making the task sort of specific to their age group and i, I was listening to a talk um yesterday uh, and, and they were saying working with with the footballers you know we'll have targets in our heads of sort of the sort of distances that we want to to have them cover in a week especially when they're doing rehab and making it more goal orientated so you know if we're going to make you cycle and i think this is some like the, the staff at liverpool were talking about this is you, they were talking about danny Ings, today you're going to cycle to, to london oh no sorry this week you're going to cycle to london rather than saying you're going to cycle this this distance so each day he would come in and be like oh i'm at like uh manchester today oh i'm at uh birmingham today you know, so it's kind of more specific to that or just like the monotonous side. You come in and you're going to cycle, you're going to do a lot of work. And the same with, I guess, an older population because of just getting people to move and, and saying, All right, I want you to squat. It's quite probably intimidating, I guess, again to them. I, I think everyone hates squats at the best of times, but <clears throat> you can make it task orientated to them so that you need to just stand up from your favourite chair or sit to stand from your favourite chair. You're still getting a similar movement. And it's probably more specific to, to what they want to do. No, that's interesting. You said that about the motivation thing, about cycling to London or whatever from Liverpool, in, as opposed to just saying mileage, because I've actually, I wasn't going to say this, but you just sparked it off in me. I've got a little challenge that I'm, it literally come to my head last night because I saw something on, online and it kind of triggered this thought. And I thought, 
about small habits. If you were to squat your body weight like 30 times a day, so if you got up and down 30 times, if you work that out over a year, the amount of weight you actually lift, you could actually put that into something, whether that's like a plane, a car, like, you know, like which sound then makes it sound like, oh, that's actually quite, quite exciting to look at. And from a motivational point of view. Um, yeah. And then I think you see those graphics all the time and like, well, again, I sort of relate back to football, but with, with the, the players with long term injuries and they say like, oh, they've lifted over their, their time they've been out like 20 cars or 20 Ford Focuses or five elephants yeah, yeah. or something like that and it, it, it probably makes it a little bit more engaging for, for those people whether whether they stick to it but I mean yeah. inactivity is just absolute, absolutely detrimental to your physical health and there's so many inactivity. studies out there yeah in terms of yeah inactivity yeah that is it's, it's an interesting one to point, point out actually because obviously as a physio, I know you're one for kind of generally, would you agree that kind of movement in general, just moving more for someone, even if they've got kind of issues, but looking at their pain threshold. So like if we were to take an example, let's say um, I'll give you an example here. So someone has like shoulder issues when they do push ups. Mm-hmm. like what would your recommendation be on that would they should they stop doing it even if they're on a wall so we we do a range of different push-ups you can do it from your tiptoes knees or even against the wall as long as that postures techniques good you can create a lot of tension just by pushing your hands into a wall right what mm-hmm. would you say to them if they they found it they had pain aggravation in their shoulder when um obviously i know it might depend but would you recommend doing none of that <laughs> avoiding that like what, what would the process kind of be? I mean, again, every everyone's going to have like a, something different going on. The shoulders, quite a complex joint. I mean, just that, if that's the one you're, you're sort of focusing on. Yeah. But um, I, I would probably advise that they, they get it looked at. And um, I mean, there's so many different orthopedic tests out there to look at what shoulder pain is and, and what structures are at fault. But there's actually papers that say when they correlated sort of actual uh, physios looking at patient's shoulders and then imaging and even surgery surgeons doing arthroscopies to have a look at what they figured out was wrong they said about 71 percent of people had more than one pathology so like more than one thing going on there so it's always very difficult i mean by the time we probably finished this talk somebody would have tried to publish a paper talking about another orthopedic test of the shoulder so yeah. so many of them out there um, but I would definitely advise that you get it checked out. And I'm not just saying that because obviously that's business and to the profession that I work in, but I, I think it's important to have someone look at it and tell you what they think is wrong. But it's also an industry where you can maybe avoid, um, like, there'll, there'll be people out there that would just want to keep you coming back, reliant on passive interventions. And, I'd say that most physios and chiros and osteos or allied health professionals won't do that. They'll just want to make you more reliant on yourself. Mm. I mean, if you're talking about the push-ups being a problem, I, I, <clears throat> I'd say that with about the majority of cases, if you, if you rehab particular muscle groups, you're going to have quite a, a profound impact on, on that person's pain in their shoulder. So if you think of like, uh, I mean, commonly you probably hear it all the time, people say, oh, it's my rotator cuff or, oh, I'm getting a pinch of my, my tendon or, or impingement issue. If you think about like what your anatomy actually does, I mean, the best way to describe it would be that, that ball and socket joint. Um, if you've ever pushed like a football underwater when you've been on holiday in a pool, have you ever done that? Yeah, yeah. So if you imagine like the water is the force of your, of your deltoids, so the bigger muscles on top of your shoulder, and then your, uh, your rotator cuff is sort of your hands, which is pushing the ball down. If your rotator cuff stops working, the ball just springs out of the water, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's similar to what will happen in your shoulder. So you, people say sometimes that, oh, my scapula is a bit weird, or I've got like this funky movement going on there. And scapular dyskinesis is a term which physios will use, but it means different things to everyone, and it, it might just be absolutely normal for somebody to move in that sort of way and in, in that manner but if you think about the muscles that act on it i mean you've got the, the three muscles i would say to 
probably maybe you if you see patients coming well your clients coming to you at a moment of shoulder pain and they can't do those particular movements is to maybe work on like their upper traps and their lower traps and serratus anterior because those are going to anchor the scapula down and keep it uh sort of to the, the chest cavity and, and that's going to help them get further around because once i think it's uh it's two, every two, every two degrees of motion that you abduct your arm so you go that way the remaining once you get to 100 degrees the remaining movement comes from your rotator cuff so that's why people often get to there and say like oh my shoulder's really kind of sore it's pinching and it and it's because the weight of the arm is too heavy and then that's the rotator cuff isn't functioning probably as well as it could it's not as efficient and then the humeral head is moving up into that subacromial space which is causing those sort of pinching sensations and normally you rehab those 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 muscles uh, and and people get better so you and you're only talking about really low level sort of um muscle contraction so you could start them on prone so lying on their front and then they have dumbbells and they just go like extend their arms backwards or to target sort of serratus anterior it's like press ups on the knees and then lower traps would just be like banded pull downs. so if you were to do maybe you're an experiment so next time you have the, the a, a client that comes to you and it's like oh i can't do that it's a bit sore try those exercises see if it improves their pain and then i guess like you said if you you know if they want to do a push-up that's the ultimate goal yeah you're kind of like building it up towards what that would be so you, you get them pushing up against the wall you maybe isolate those movements that we talked about a little bit more and focus on those muscles and then see see what's going on so one that someone could do right now at home with no dumbbells you yes. just said hop, well hold dumbbells you said straighten the arms right there but if they held like two like bottles of water or whatever yeah that would be fine way. yeah that'd be fine and it extends back yeah so you're kind of doing oh, that motion okay yeah and, and then to get like a crunch out here huh? yeah 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 back in the walnut yeah <laughs> yeah oh no that's that's good to go for because i think having something to go and do is often quite a good takeaway from this because you know we can chat about everything but then it will just come down to something that isn't quite doable now like yeah i mean it. if someone's got like a an underlying sort of slap tear in their shoulder then those exercises are obviously not going to be appropriate that's why i kind of say i'd advise that you see someone and it's interesting for how this has affected well this will this sort of pandemic will affect the profession because Obviously, I know, I know a lot of people may be expected sort of like passive interventions when they go to see physiotherapists or, or chiros, osteos, but maybe now it would be a little bit more emphasis on empowering patients to, to be more active and look after their own health, which is ultimately what I, I hope my practice has always been about. Um, yeah. I think yeah. My yeah. Opinion, if, I'm, if you've been with me for more than sort of four sessions and you're not making improvement, then we need to be looking at moving you, you know, we need to be looking at further investigating what the, the problem is to help you. Oh, unless it's obviously something long-term, which is going to be like an ACL or post-op rehab surgery. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think, yeah, I did see something online the other day from a physio who said that their movement online onto Zoom and has actually been very easy simply because they're used to very much just giving the person exercises to do. So nothing's really changed. Mm. Though from the outside, you might think it would have. And obviously they can't do, you know, often like hands-on stuff all the time. But, um, you know, he actually said that that is sometimes, you know, secondary to, to what they kind of go through. So given that, what do you have any kind of, I know this is very individual as well, but guidelines as to what would you say to someone who, um is unsure what they how much to push it so i know it's a so difficult one but pain is so subjective right so and and i've, I've heard from some people that you know oh, i hurt my shoulder before then i did nothing then i ended up with frozen shoulder i don't know how true that link is but what what's kind of the recommendation with that like is there a in like exercise for example we have like rpe like rated perceived exertion like how hard did you find that on a scale of one to ten like do you use a similar thing with pain i know it's very subjective but yeah what's your thoughts on that yeah so there i mean 
So there is an outcome measure like the visual analog scale, which is basically like an RPE. Well, it's just zero to 10, how do you rate your pain? But like you said, it's so subjective and there's so many different factors which will influence what somebody said. Um, normally, I'd say to, to, to my patients, look, if it causes you anything that you perceive to be above a two or a three out of 10, let me know and we'll change what you're doing. Um, but in some cases, you know, like with tendinopathy, so, you know, people often complain of like knee pain or sort of Achilles tendinopathies. Um, again, if they've been diagnosed properly and, and you're confident you've got it, you do kind of have to push through the pain barrier a little bit to get better at those because of the tendon just causes the pain, which stops you from being functional essentially. And then your muscles start to deteriorate um, and then you're not as strong. And then that just leads to this vicious circle. of You get weaker, it gets more painful, you get less functional and you just keep moving on in that pattern. So sometimes it is appropriate to work into pain, but that is it's such a, it, by case by case, there'll be times when you go, no, you need to rest that. Like, you know, if you've got an acute muscle injury, um, I mean, people often say like, oh, you know, I've iced it. But when we have our, our footballers who, um, who will do their sort of <coughs> hamstrings, we send them home for a couple of days, just with a machine that will purely ice their hamstrings. So it is an important part of it. And I think people misunderstand how much time that maybe professional athletes will, will dedicate to just doing that in the early part of an injury. So the yeah, to answer your question, it's very difficult to say like, oh yeah, if, if you've got this pain, you should stop or you should carry on. It, it really depends on the pathology that you have. But I'd say more often than not, people will, you know, who, who should, and I've had this conversation with you before, I think strength and conditioning should be a big part of the NHS because I don't think physiotherapists probably get the, the appropriate setting in the NHS and time, which I understand why, because it's such an in-demand service to spend with their patients, to get them lifting and moving in a particular way, but then allows them to be comfortable to, to go out and take that onto their own. And I think personal trainers are doing a really good job of that in terms of getting people moving and just introducing them to exercise because nine times out of 10, you're probably giving them very similar stuff that we would. Um, and hopefully, I don't know, you might have success stories of your own where you said patients have come to you saying like, oh, this is a bit sore, this has been a bit sore. And then after a few weeks, you've kind of worked with them and you've kept them within their pain sort of threshold and they've gotten a lot better. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Well, it's funny you just mentioned that. It kind of brings me on to a question that's just come in now. So um, Ali has asked, it's funny you mentioned that. Sometimes you, I get a pain that eases as I warm up and continue so when she's once she's warmed up and she's doing it it's fine but she can feel a bit of pain when she's warming up but then when she stops again and then starts again it can they she can then feel it again I, i'm touching my shoulder i don't even know if it is the shoulder <laughs> no she hasn't even said where it is i just always go shoulder yeah um, when you think about the physiological effects of exercise you're going to get a lot of blood flow into the area without knowing the context of the actual injury it's difficult to say like why that probably is happening but if i talk about i don't know um uh, like a, a patella uh, sorry like an achilles tendinopathy for example you kind of get like a an, an ingrowth of vascularization so you get blood vessels growing into the tendon which shouldn't be there which is why it becomes such a sensitive structure and then because of their growing it gets thicker and then you can feel like a palpable lump. And that's why people say like, oh, it's sore there. And I've stopped, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable, but when I load it, it feels better. And the reason is the tendons sort of uh, different structures in your body. So tendons, for example, will adapt quite nicely to load. So, you know, if you're doing your calf raises, if we're just taking Achilles tendinopathy, for an example, what, what tends to happen is you deregulate sort of the ground substance, which is the stuff which is making the tendon get thicker in the first place. And you're kind of re trying to get your body to re-encourage like a realignment of those fibers or the natural fibers of your tendon. Um, and then over time, that just gets rid of all the gunk that is creating the space for the blood vessels to, to grow into. And then you've got more sort of solid anatomically tendon and then the pain goes away. But obviously the, the pain will, will be there when you're working out or it will stop when you're working out and then it will come back later. So it, I mean, without knowing a bit more about the context, Ali, it's, it's, it's difficult to say yeah. 
what you should definitely be doing. But um, but yeah, there, there are certainly different pathologies that react differently to sort of exercises. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get that. I'll see if she um, does add in anything. So I know there's a bit of a lag on here, but no, it's it's interesting what you said about the pain threshold thing before. I mean, I know we're going back a bit, but mm -hmm. pain threshold, how subjective it is. So for example, I don't know the research in that, but I know for rate of perceived exertion, for example, if I said, if we did a workout and I asked them the second they stop, how hard they felt it, how hard they felt it was, they'll rate it higher. Whereas if we leave it 10 minutes, warm down, have a coffee, have a chat, and then I go, oh, how hard do you find today? Then they, they go, no, I wasn't too bad, actually. It was only about five. <laughs> but they find the rating comes down because obviously your past memory is right there. But yeah, things like sleep, stress, tiredness, like daily, day-to-day -day lives can probably impact just how much pain you're getting in an area, right? Yeah, I mean, that is some of the biggest areas that we look at. Uh, with, the, with the athletes we work with so I mean if their sleep has, pattern has been good uh, it, well if we can find a way to monitor their sleep and nutrition sort of their training load um, and then sort of uh, water intake you know if, if we can if we can control well not control but if we can monitor all of those and and, and just be good at that but we found that we get much better sort of res results Mm. rather than focusing on like the minor things that, that might be the buzz things in the media or the buzz things in the industry at the time it's it's just important about controlling the controllables and looking at what the big ones that you can control it. yeah so um i know this is again very uh, this is all very yeah independent context specific but um quite a lot of the ladies will come in and they'll start off and they'll say i've had a knee replacement and or a hip replacement like, so I need to be wary of um, certain things like kneeling on one leg, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you kind of recommend as a go-to thing to kind of strengthen muscles around that without kind of putting too much stress on the, the knees, hips? Is there anything you kind of recommend with that? Yeah, I, I mean, again, <clears throat> it's all very much dependent on case to case because different surgeons will have different techniques. I mean, predominantly sort of hip arthroscopies and knee replacements are, are, are the same. But um, um, so, so you kind of you kind of guided by the, the, the client and what the surgeon said because um, obviously an older replacement might not be as robust as, as a as a newer one. Yeah. Um, so you're kind of just working with that person to see where they're comfortable. But I mean, really, in my head, the same principles apply. You know inactivity is detrimental to muscles you've already had a massive surgery in that area anyway you are going to need to strengthen that back up and it's just a case of finding out probably by sitting down with your consultant who did it when you when you act like they, they come to see you, you for the final time and saying like what can i truly like push this to like capacity wise what can i get away with um because if you're the one that's sort of willing just to I don't know, be, be inactive, just accept that maybe your life is, is changed and you're not going to be doing as much anymore. I mean, it only takes, I think there's, there's tons of studies out there saying inactivity is like a big driver for reduced health. But I mean, especially now more than ever, people will probably be doing even less, right? So I think it was 14 days of reduced steps um, introduced a reduction in lower limb muscle mass by up to 4%. And if you've had an, an orthopedic surgery as well, and you then now become inactive, it's just a huge, huge problem. So I would definitely say exercise is going to be beneficial. Maybe if you're struggling with particular movements, you can use isometrics. We were having a discussion about this the other day. So isometrics would be like a, a movement through which you are putting load through the muscle, but you're not moving it. Um, so it might be like a, a, a hamstring bridge where you hold it at the top. Yeah. And um, we were talking about it the other day because if they're so low level, they don't really hurt or they don't really cause you that common sort of like post-exercise discomfort that you'll get with like eccentric and concentric exercise the following day. And we're thinking like, oh, maybe we should use more of them because maybe in my practice, I'm always doing more things functionally more movements but maybe if that's the thing to help start to get people going and, and, and give them the bug for getting back into to exercising and they're good things to have in the toolbox 
Yeah, hundred percent. And it's interesting you say that because there's quite a lot on that about kind of. I guess that's going to help someone's mind muscle connection a bit as well. Mm-hmm. Like for example, we did something in the session today, um, and I know not everyone might be able to do this, but if you literally just grab a book, I know this is a small book, but whatever. If I grab even your hands, it doesn't really matter. If you literally just push your hands in together like this, and you could find you can find quite comfortably where it may be painful, I guess. Right. And but my point is that you can start to feel your chest muscles if, as you bring your elbows in, yeah. almost like you're doing some kind of weighted press, etc. Um, also, again, I've mirrored like uh, a leg extension with a towel. Right. So you can put a towel, um, tie a knot around your ankle, pull it towards you and just straighten your leg. So I'm essentially adding resistance on the way up. But then you can just get someone to push it down, etc. if you wanted to. But yeah, even straightening your leg, getting that tension in squeeze it if you then apply that to a squat you're probably going to be with better form technique in there in there as well yeah and like again you were talking about sort of um like pressing and and feeling did you say like just even just getting that little contraction through there there was good papers again sort of indicating that grip if if people um so elderly people with decreased grip strength um were going to be more vulnerable to picking up sort of uh other diseases or more or more vulnerable to longer hospital stays and i know that that's a really like niche thing to look at but like it's obviously making sense i know grip strength isn't maybe something very functional but i guess if you're you're working out regular you're going to have a better grip strength than someone who's not for ages and then you're going to have and especially in this climate you're going to have a better chance of of coming out of, of hospital stays yeah and i guess that you can um you can look at bone density with that as well from exercise and then from a nutritional point of view um obviously sarcopenia which is muscle loss with age this is a this is a huge area when i when i was um doing my postgrad like sarcopenia was already getting more like we do loads about i'd never heard of it before i went to it to be honest and um, we had richie Kerwin on uh, the podcast last year now um who's doing research into muscle loss with age and looking at protein and resistance exercise for people who have had cardiovascular events, long stays in hospital, perhaps muscle loss. Normally they go into a cardio program, which is fine. Um, Obviously like to kind of just a standard exercise program, but they're looking at higher protein diets. Obviously we know that even from bed rest studies, it's quite powerful actually bed rest studies um, where people are obviously in bed in hospital not moving you feed them a higher protein diet slash um better quality protein to make sure they're getting the, the amino acids so it's mainly leucine um which are normally found in like meat chicken eggs dairy etc they preserve muscle without even moving in some cases better so than not and and actually going back to like the knee replacement hip replacement thing uh, a few of the ladies have actually had have been working on the program in like waiting for their knee op and it's as you as you probably know with the nhs it's like i'm waiting for my appointment i'm waiting for my appointment like she's just getting ready getting ready trying to one kind of make sure the muscle is as strong as possible before and i've had some great messages from from a few ladies who have been in and said look if it wasn't for the sessions if it wasn't for me being able to exercise like that i'm not sure what i'd be like now yeah yeah. and it's amazing like one of the ladies is is doing better now than she like a lot better now than than ever yeah well, they say don't they like if exercise was a drug it'd be the most prescribed mm. thing and i agree i mean it's interesting when i was i think the point for me was really driven home when i was doing my master's so <clears throat> we were looking at um physical health and, and cancer patients and that can obviously be quite like a sensitive subject anyway and for me as somebody who probably hasn't worked with that population for a long time um to go back and look at it again was quite intimidating and, and you get somebody with like a really serious horrible like life-changing disease like a cancer and they come to you and you're trying to give them ideas for rehab and exercise and what they actually found was that the, the people who were sort of higher well reported higher levels of activity and were doing more were actually um sort of recovering quicker off of those sort of after they come through their chemo and, and things like that so that was really interesting and then um you know there's tons of surgeries out there 
Um, and again, there was another module we, we were looking at in terms of uh, higher survival rates of patients after they've had like a, a trauma or elective surgery. And if they did like a period of prehab, so they would do, they split the, the, the cohort for the purpose of the study into two groups. So you had the one that just did nothing and then came and did the, the surgery and then left. And then you had the ones that did like a, a six week exercise program through the hospital came had the surgery and then <clears throat> and then left and you found that the ones that did the prehab recovered so much quicker mm. and you think about the cost of what it would be to to put on a circuit as opposed to a longer hospital stay it's obviously helps out the nhs and, and people are talking now about protecting the nhs so being physically active and physically healthy within reason is going to be such a huge thing for the future i think at the minute mm, yes yeah, that's, that's powerful actually though i do know a few people who have um mentioned that their consultants have said just what a difference their previous activities like exercises had on their response to you know um you know, and, and other operations and i think the people that need to do more exercise probably know it deep down but it's also a very difficult topic probably for the, the health professional to, to bring up for them mm. and that's going off off topic a little bit but it can be quite yeah. a difficult conversation to have Oh, definitely, because there's so much emotion, right? If you've been just been diagnosed with something and then someone's telling you to do X, Y, and Z, it's not a, a nice conversation to have. Um, and I think the person's got, I think we have a right to know of the information, um, but as a conversation, yeah, it's not It's not as simple as just saying, you yeah, know, go and do that because, you know, yeah, someone needs the right support. And as you said, is there that at the moment? I'm, I'm not too sure. And, and and I've got, an, it's interesting you brought that up because I have two questions. So uh, based around the same thing, really. So one of the ladies, um, someone who I, who I know, she uh, had cancer, mm -hmm. uh, breast cancer. And then she was never really, give, she was given, when she left, she was given exercises for rehab, mm -hmm. which were really gentle, but she was never then shown the next stage. So is that it forever? Like to, to them, it was just like, that's all we have. And like, to, as she, she went back to investigate and there was nothing else. That was it. They give you rehab, but you were never told if you could do a push up again. You were never told if you could. Yeah. Do you, do you have any, is there any much research on that? Like, uh, it's something I'd have to go and have a, have a look at. It's not something I've, I've looked at for a little while, but I know at the time of when we were doing it uh, at uni, it was definitely an emerging topic because it is pretty daunting to, to talk about. It's pretty scary mm -hmm. for the patient. So I don't know. I think there were established guidelines in terms of you should be doing X amount of activity a week if you have this, but I can't remember what that was without going back and having a look. But yeah, I, it comes back to what we said at the very start, like taking each case on its merit. So, you know, pe some people will really kind of think like, I feel okay and I, I could do that. And that's what I'm talking about. Those people who were higher sort of activity levels before will probably respond better to, to doing exercise. They're going through their treatments in and after because of they've got that sort of base there already. And I do think it is very important because, you know, you hear that C word and then you get health professionals sort of like back off. Like you say, like they give them that first step. There's nothing then that maybe comes after it because they're all a little bit tentative about perceiving that person to be really quite vulnerable but actually they're kind of thinking now well, the more exercise you do it actually improves your sort of response to your, your treatments that are actually going to treat the disease so yeah it's definitely an important thing to do whether I would definitely go and say like oh, we should do this you should do this I'd, I'd look at each individual and go well, this is where you're at this is what you can currently do let's try and improve on that let's keep doing this and just as long as it was safe and their uh, sort of doctors were happy and the patient was happy and that would all be good. Yeah, and I think I think it it stems in with um, the chat I had before about sarcopenia. Actually, like sarcopenia, um, muscle loss with age. Just about um, there's a quote from one researcher. I actually can't remember who said it, um, but he said um, it's not the disease that often is the issue. It's often the recovery from it. Um, and obviously, the amount of muscle you lose during the fight against whatever it is is a big 
big thing in terms of if someone loses a lot of muscle they become frail then they're then they're at risk of, of a fall there's some horrendous statistics on falls and hip fractures yeah uh, yeah it's quite scary actually yeah i mean um it's interesting you said about like whether it's actually the aging i was listening to a, a talk and the president uh, the presenter was saying well is it actually the effect of aging that we're getting from sarcopenia or is it just the disuse you know of people becoming less active as they get older because they perceive that's what should happen and they becoming less functional because of that as opposed to like physiological aging and there was interesting studies looking at um motor unit loss in in the i know it's a really tiny muscle but tib anterior so like at the front of your your leg and um they compared sort of young runners to older runners and they found that actually the muscle side sorry the motor unit loss was very little between the two groups if they continued activity but the ones who came in as all the control group who, who had done no activity had had such small like motor units so it's obvious that they weren't going to be as strong or uh, as good at functional activities so i i get a there's probably more studies being done into this because of like well, I think people are becoming more aware but is it actually aging that's causing sarcopenia or is it just that we get older and we we're disused I don't dispute that the muscles become probably less efficient but yeah um, yeah they're definitely like from a nutritional point of view yeah like from a nutritional point of view they're definitely less um sensitive to um uh pressure and exercise so you need more protein probably more quality protein um than you would before um mm. as well as that you may need actual bigger dose as well um as you age um speaking of which uh, another question was how do you increase grip strength i have elderly clients so uh, she's on about more of a like care setting because it's interesting you say about about grip strength how it's a difficult one like from a nutritional point of view i know they found like grip strength with regards to opening jars right so someone's less likely to eat enough calories if they can't really open a jar or they might just then go in like if you think of foods that are often in jars and tins and stuff that could be tuna or whatever um you know, whatever they're eating from a jar tins and stuff but it can put people off cooking not to mention this is going off a bit but teeth as well but that is um, yeah, if people can't chew certain foods, etc. But yeah, going back to grip strength, any recommendations that people can do? It's interesting. I mean, I, I wouldn't probably be telling people, you know, that's a sole exercise you've got to do is go away and get like handheld dynamometer yeah. or, or something and just sit there and grip. I think what the study is probably showing is it's a really easy outcome measure that you can look at really quickly. It's cost effective. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to look at something, if your intervention was having an effect, you could maybe use that as your yeah your outcome measure to look at baselines and then pre-activity. Because I guess the, the point of the study is that people who are still doing exercise and still moving, still, you know, maybe if they're lifting really light weights, they're going to be accustomed to holding things all the time or bars, yeah. bands, whatever they're using as a form of resistance. Or even if it's just their body weight, they're still going to have a stronger grip strength and that's going to tell you something. So... I wouldn't say like, oh, here's your program, go away and do tons of grip strength because that's going to help prevent all these things. I think it's just an associated measure through you actually being active, you're actually exercising, and then it actually, that, that'll show. I mean, there's, there's other stuff you could use, but it's just the simplicity of that. And I mean, this study's looking at people like 65, 70. So, you know, they're looking at people that are probably quite frail anyway. Yeah. Not, not all of them, but there, there are going to be a lot of people in there who have just decided to be inactive uh, or or have just stopped being as active as maybe what they once were. And then that whole, like you said, that degeneration, especially if you've got any sort of underlying pathology where this is full of inflammatory markers, so like arthritis, you're going to get those metabolic alterations. And like you said, then you get the de deregulation of, uh, of protein um, synthesis, and then you're going to just lose muscle mass and then you're in that vicious circle then. So yeah. I wouldn't say like do grip strength like all the time, but I was just saying that was an interesting paper to look at from a point of view of an outcome measure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's more basically more grip strength is just associated with being more physically active. 
generally, especially resistance work. Like, you know, if you're holding stuff, like even if it's bottles or whatever, if you're holding a bottle and you're gripping it whilst doing some punches or whatever, mm-hmm. that's going to hit your forearms, etc. Pushing them, pushing the bottle together, just make sure the lid's on it and just pop in your face or whatever. Yeah, um, or even carrying shopping bags and, and stuff yeah, like that. So. It's, it's interesting, the shopping bag one, actually, because I often get people say, um, oh, I could never lift that or I can't do that. But then, you know, back when life was normal, I'd see him in, in the supermarket, <laughs> like holding like eight pints of milk. You're right. Hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, full bags. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much all the questions I've had at the moment. Um, yeah, anything else you kind of want to add to that? Or if anyone does have any questions, um, feel free to comment below. Anything else you want to add to that at the moment? No, it'd just be that I think remaining physically active, especially at this time, is going to be really important, not just for Hmm. particular populations but everyone um the, the effects of exercise are so well documented and it's so easy to go out there and look at the different effects of of what exercise can have on, on different pathologies and um and musculoskeletal condition so and i, I think probably like i said to you earlier the the, the uh the, the industry that i work in will change I was always quite big on exercise advice. I'd always use my passive interventions as, as complementary sort of adjuncts to what I wanted to, to empower the patient to be able to go away and do for themselves. And I think it will definitely, the more successful practitioners in this sort of like climate will probably arise from that as opposed to the ones that are always sticking needles in or getting hands on with people or trying to reposition people. And I mean, you might, you might hear all the time like about oh i'm out of alignment or something like that i think that's a very difficult term to uh maybe it's something that patients feel like they're familiar with and they can come and especially to a personal trainer and say like oh i'm, I'm out of alignment so i can't do that or i can't do this exercise because of so and so has told me this i mean there's no one right way to move like f- for me to, t- to tell you oh you don't move very well or you're out of alignment unless you've got like a massive scoliosis i think that can be quite misleading does that make sense yeah, yeah no, no, i get that i mean everyone's no one's symmetrical right we're not i guess we're not supposed to be right unless you're a bodybuilder <laughs> and so like literally i guess you're always going to have kind of slightly imbalance imbalances and i think yeah oh i've just had a question hang on uh Rita said, I don't have hip problems, but lying on it for exercise is sore. Um, any thoughts on that? Again, it's really difficult to sort of diagnose without probably having a little bit more information and, and seeing the joint. But I mean, maybe if it's sore from lying on it, it could be, I mean, I, I assume Rita probably would remember if she'd bruised it or anything like that, or if it's been going on for a long time, it might be irritable bursa so you have like little fluid filled sacs which just basically act as a, a lubricant between the joints um sorry between the muscles or, or tendons and sort of spaces within the joint so around your hip you can you've got a few of those and obviously if you're lying on the side it could be sort of greater trochanteric pain there's a lot of different things it could be but i mean ultimately the principles of, of rehab i don't want to generalize physio and say that like everything can be treated like this but it's normally acute management so your ice your rest, um, compression, elevation, those sorts of things. And then just gentle movement. So you're working in ranges where you're comfortable. So say if you don't really like lying on your side, you could be doing some work on the contralateral side. So you're still working those muscles, trying to get them going, stretching, making sure you've got similar range of movement because you want to restore your full range of movement. Say if you're really struggling, I mean, there's some orthopedic tests you can look at. So you take the leg back and you're looking at how far you can sort of adapt it yeah and if if that's really tight and you've got really tight sort of outside structures on your leg you, you need to stretch them off because if they're tight and then you're putting them into positions to 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 make the muscles work and contract it's going to be uncomfortable and sore so there'll be a few different things you can try but i mean i would definitely start with just icing it give it a couple of days off rest it you don't want to rest it any more than that you need to start introducing load after that point um and then just gently exercise 
try and get your range of movement back and then try and revisit those exercises that were sore, see if it works. I mean, sometimes it could be that when we do more, we notice it more, right? So if you start adding exercises in where you're lying on your side, um, which we do quite a lot for some people, because mm -hmm. you, you, you might never have done it for that long a period of time. If you're, you know, rotating your legs around, doing, you know, knees up and down, et cetera, whatever, you're on it more so you notice it more. It's a bit like um, if someone starts a diet, they start eating really well, et cetera. But then when they have like one day where they're like, oh, it's a bit rubbish, they, they beat themselves up more because they're it, it's further away than what they were doing. They were doing so well. Now they're doing average or a little bit rubbish, but now it's a big thing because they notice it more because it's such a difference. I guess it can sometimes be something like that. But yeah, with the icing, I guess, yeah, good point earlier about, you know, football is sent home with an actual ice machine. Like mm -hmm. if I ever get an injury, I remember I'd probably get an ice, get some peas on it for 10 minutes and then go, right, there, that'll do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, the guy who uh, who made those machines is an absolute monopoly. I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> about, I think they're about like five grand each. So. Wow. Yeah, they're expensive. I my peas for now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. No, that's all good. Thanks a lot for that. Um, that. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to send them. Is there anywhere like people can, can go for more information from you if they wanted to? Um, what in terms of looking at the topics that we've, we've spoken about? Yeah. Um, so I was I was looking last night. Uh, I mean, I really like Twitter as a as a source of information. I know that that's probably not what everybody would would be their first go to. I mean, other than obviously scientific sort of peer-reviewed journals um, but I don't know how many people are going to pick them up but um, yeah yeah there was a really good could I, could I forward if someone had a question could I just forward it on to you is that all right if yeah yeah of course yeah yeah information. yeah yeah um I mean there was an account strength for life which was just basically a, a bunch of s and c's and physios who had got together um okay. Well, it's actually one, but he collates sort of ideas of, of all different people in the field. And there's some really interesting papers on there and you don't even have to read them. They're just infographics. And I know that can be dangerous sometimes, but yeah. um, like the overwhelming sort of like exercise is such a key part of a good health, which is kind of common sense anyway. Um, but the, 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 I think it really drives the point home in some of their studies and some of the infographics that they were putting well, out. That's strength strength for life was the account so it's at strength on twitter okay. yeah. i'll note it in the comments strength for life on twitter so that'll be at strength the number four underscore life cool no that was a that was a pretty interesting account to look through cool. perfect yeah i'll put that in just so i've remembered it brilliant Right, thanks for that, Tom. No worries, man. And uh, if anyone has any other questions, just um, let me know and I'll, I can always forward them on. Perfect. Cheers, Tom. Cheers, thanks. Take care. See you later. Yeah, bye. bye.